So what a difference a year makes being in this role. How did you prepare for it and what has it been like so far? Lots and lots of reading. Um, lots of having the experts come and sit down with me and walk me through the history of conflicts, um, where we are, where we're going, all of that, and just learning. Every day has been a crash course, but it's it's great because every day I know I'm going to learn something new. So it's it's been a great um, honor to serve, but it's also been a total change from being governor because you go from domestic policy to foreign policy, um, but we've had a great time. Quite a learning curve, that's yes, for sure. Yes. <laughs> what do you consider your biggest accomplishment so far? I think um, trying to show value in the UN and trying to get the UN to understand they can't take the United States for granted anymore. That's been one part of it, reforming the UN so that they're they appreciate the value of a dollar and they understand these are taxpayer dollars and we want to see that dealt with. And then getting people to understand what the UN does, really trying to communicate foreign policy through the United Nations in a way that your average person doesn't have to work hard to understand. That's always been a goal. How does your work in this position impact the everyday American? I think, first of all, their taxpayer dollars go to the United Nations. So they deserve to know how it's being used and they deserve to know that the ambassador is using the UN in return, whether it's negotiations, whether it's pushing US policy, whether it's communicating with the public on everything that's happening. And so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is peace and security. This is a place where negotiations happen every day. And South Carolinians want to know that their children are going to be safe. And this is the place where we talk about how to do that and how to get it done. And sometimes that means calling out countries that are um, supporting terrorism or, or doing nuclear threats that they're not supposed to be doing. And sometimes that means coming together and finding common ground on how we can better work as a unit. So um, South Carolinians, my goal is I want them to care about what happens at the UN. And I want them to understand it's not perfect by any means, but I'm going to use every ounce of it to fight for the United States. Was being a woman in this position and also new to a position like this, what has it been like to stand up to countries like Russia and North Korea and Iran? You know, I have such a love for this country and I have pride in the United States. And so I'm not going to let anyone put down our country. I'm not going to let anyone try and derail or tell lies about it or anything that's going to in any way demean the American public. And so for me, it's a service, but it's something I'm extremely passionate about. So it's, it's not hard when you're fighting for something you believe in. How do President, President Trump's words and actions impact your work here? It actually is helpful at times because a lot of countries don't know what he's going to do. So that's made them be more cautious about how they deal with us in a good way, that they don't just assume we're always going to be there. Now they check with us a little bit more or they're negotiating a little bit better or they realize that he could go one way or the other. And I use it. You know, I say, I can't always promise you what the president's going to do. And so through that, you negotiate to get to where you want to go. So how do you balance the Trump administration needs over other countries' needs in this position? Well, I think that the president's made it very clear that it needs to be America first, but we've also said it's not America only, right? It's so a lot of it is if we can keep peace and security, if we can keep the citizens of the United States safe, and if we can make sure that they feel protected, um, then we have to do that. And that means making sure regions around the world are safe and that they are protected. And so I think that what the president has always said is we have to make sure there's never a threat on American soil. And so our fight every day is to keep threats in the region that they're in, but then also defeat the terrorism that's a part of that. We have the Winter Olympics coming up. And recently they announced that North Korea would be joining South Korea for the games. What are your thoughts on their inclusion? I think that's fine. North Korea and South Korea have to, you know, they're brothers and sisters, so they have to get along. I hope that the whole feeling of the Olympics of, you know, unity and peace and bringing countries together, I hope it sets in with them. But we're not going to let up on the threat and we're not going to let up on the pressure. This is kind of bouncing off of that. Um, recently, the UN Secretary General mentioned that he thought worldwide concern about nuclear weapons is greater than it ever has been since the Cold War. What are your thoughts on that? And is there a way to resolve it? I, it is a problem, but you have, to have a country that has nuclear weapons is one thing. To have an irresponsible country with nuclear weapons, 
That's the threat. And when those weapons are sold and they're used by those that don't want, um, that don't mean right in the world, that don't want to um, focus on good things, they want to focus on bad things, it's a problem. And right now we need to be very focused on the nuclear threat. The fact that North Korea is our number one issue right now is because you have an irresponsible leader continuing to build up his nuclear arsenal. Yesterday, the Palestinian representative was talking about some issues he had seen with the withdrawal of funding from the humanitarian groups helping those refugees there. Um, and he said it seemed like this money was being used as a political tool. What's your take on that? So President Abbas not only denied our vice president a meeting, he criticized our president, he criticized our country, and he said the peace talks were dead. And then he's going to hand out his hand with a blank check. We're not going to pay to be abused. We're not going to do that. And there were 128 countries that voted with them that can pay that up just the same. And so this is again showing American strength, which is we want to help those that want to work with us. If you don't want to work with us, we're not going to pay your bills for you. And so I think that the Palestinians are realizing we mean business, and I think they will come back to the table for a peace deal. What do you see the future holding for you and your career? Maybe a bid for the White House in the next few years? I think we're going to go home to South Carolina. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I've never, I would have never thought I'd end up here. And I've always felt like I was blessed. You know, wherever God opens a door, you know, you move through it. But I've never thought about what I want to be five and ten years from now. I just feel like whatever you do, be great at it and make sure people remember you for it. My mom drilled that into me for so long that that's what I focus on is just doing my job well. And then when it's over, we go home. What do you miss most about South Carolina? Oh, what don't I miss about South Carolina? I miss the people so much. Um, I miss the grass. I miss the trees. I miss how beautiful it is. I miss... Um, football season and being at the games. I miss Heritage Golf Tournament. There's so much that we miss, but we try and get back as often as we can. We're there for spring break. We're there for summer vacation. So every chance we get to kiss the ground in South Carolina, we do. What has the transition been like to move here to New York City? Everything was different. The culture is different. You know, when I talked about the grass and the trees, everybody said, you can go to Central Park. I mean, the idea of going to a park to see grass was amazing to me. The, the weather, it's freezing here, um, you know, dealing with the cold, but it's a great city. And, you know, this isn't a place that I'd want to live forever, but you can't get a bad meal here. There's always something to do. The culture diversity is amazing. And um, really, we're just trying to enjoy every minute of it that we can. What's been the most unique experience that you've had working with the UN so far? I think. Um, Going and seeing things in person, whether it's the Syrian refugees um, that we went and saw, whether it's going to South Sudan and Democratic Republic of Congo and seeing the turmoil that they're in, um, going to Afghanistan and seeing our troops and what they're doing and the threats there. To hear it is one thing, to see it is so different and it brings a different perspective to it. So really that's been an amazing part of this year. What was your biggest inspiration for taking this role? Were there some things that you talked to President Trump about that you wanted to make sure he was on board with before you stepped in? Well, I never would have thought that this would be a role that I would be interested in. I wasn't that sure of what the United Nations did um, and how I could be effective at it. But I did tell him that it had to be a cabinet position. And he said, done. And I said, it has to be um, I want to be a part of the National Security Council. I need to be in the room when policy is made. Um, and he said, done. And then I said, I'm not going to be a wallflower or a talking head. And he said, that's why I want you to do this. And so he's been very supportive. And giving me those has made a big difference. Because you can't go from being governor to being told what to say. But you can go from being governor and using those traits into a negotiation situation, into a situation where you represent the country, into a way that you want the people to be more informed. And that's what he's allowed me to do. How has your experience as governor impacted your experience here at the UN? I think, you know, well, I'm an accountant, so the reform part's always going to be with me, and, and that part of governing, um, the negotiations are really the same. You're just dealing with countries as opposed, as opposed to, to um, companies. I think that the ability to communicate and make sure that you say what needs to be said in the tone that you need to say it, all of those things um, coming together 
you realize you use all those same tools that I used as governor, I'm now trying to use here at the UN. Is it easier or harder to deal with these representatives from other countries compared to the lawmakers in South Carolina? I think that at times they can be similar. There were times when legislators did feel like the Russians, but I can tell you that, um, you know, it's challenging. It is because every country obviously has their own interests in mind. And our goal is to turn around and make sure their interests align with ours. And so a lot of times you just have to talk in the way that they can understand and that they see the benefit. So I, it can be tough at times, but you know, negotiations are negotiations. And um, whether it's the legislature or whether it's the, the Russians, that's, you know, that's the fun in it. Has there been a country that's been more difficult to deal with than others? You know, I think obviously from a threat standpoint, North Korea is the one. Or looking at Iran, those are difficult. Uh, the Russians continue to be difficult. Um, they try and stop everything that we start. They um, are very critical of the United States, but we continue to work with them. We were get able to get them on board um, with the peacekeeping reforms that we're doing and saving on the money. We've been able to get them on board with the North Korea resolutions, all three of them. And so we continue to work together where we can, and we continue to call them out when we have to. Now that you're on this world stage, that so you have a pretty good view of what's happening globally, what do you see as the biggest issue facing our world right now? I think, from what I can tell, the biggest issue is North Korea. It is just such a deep threat that we have to make sure we stand strong on. And then that sleeping giant is Iran. Because right now, even though there's the nuclear deal, they are still testing ballistic missiles. They are still supporting terrorism. They're still selling their arms. And all of those are violations. And we just gave them a whole lot of money to do it. And that's terrible. And so we've got to roll that back and get it in line so that we're holding them accountable. Was that last one? Or I get one more, Cheney. Sorry. You can do one. more. Yesterday, when you gave your speech in front of the Security Council, you said, you know, this Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's a big deal, but there's a bigger issue out there. Can you speak towards that? Well, you know, this, they have this Middle East process every single month. And every single month they choose to talk about Israel and the Palestinians. But we have real threats. We've got ISIS, we've got Hamas, we've got Hezbollah, we've got all of these threats that are in the region that they are not talking about. And so I continue to push them and say, why aren't we talking about Iran? Why aren't we talking about the terrorism in the area? Why aren't we talking about what we're going to do about it? Um, so I think they have gotten my point, and I think that they realize that this is something that needs to change. And I think they're going to be forced to have to change it because the threats are um, more real than just the Israelis and the Palestinians. Anything else you want to add? Anything you think I missed? It will always be a great day in South Carolina. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Is such no, a pleasure. I love that you came. <laughs>